Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming out. Thanks for braving your hangovers and, uh, and coming to hear about uh, fixing cloud storage encryption. Um, uh, my name is Adam Everspaugh. This is my first ShmooCon. It's my first ShmooCon talk, and it's my first ShmooCon. Uh, super excited to be here. This has been a really fun, uh, really fun weekend. Uh, I, uh, I'm a security engineer and a cryptographer for a company called Coinbase, uh, but what I want to talk about today is some work I did as a PhD student uh, at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and this is some joint work uh, with these fine cryptographers. Uh, we published a paper, Crypto 2017, and what I wanted to bring to ShmooCon is an attempt to take 45 pages of dense security theorems, proofs, and provable security and show how it applies to real world problems. And I want to do this because I think this is a really important problem. We spend a lot of time studying updatable encryption, and it turns out we're using updatable encryption in the real world, and I'm pretty sure everybody's doing it wrong. And so I'm hoping to here surface this to the community so you guys can understand what are these topics, uh, why we should care, and ideally how we can do it better. All right, so what I want to talk about today is key rotation. And I claim key rotation is broken. And why is that a bad thing? Well, key rotation makes sad Biden sad, and this picture breaks my heart, so we should fix this. All right, so I'm going to introduce updatable encryption. I'm going to talk about the obvious way to use updatable encryption. It's a technique I'm going to call simple envelope encryption in this talk. And we're pretty sure this is the same technique that everybody's actually using right now. And then I'm going to show some attacks against this attack, or against this technique. So two different threat models. Um, in a first threat model, I'm going to show an attack I call a mix and match attack, and then I'm going to show how to fix it. And we're going to fix it by introducing a new scheme called KISS, uh, and it's going to be uh, very high performance, um, and it's going to solve this very basic threat model. And then we're going to escalate the threat model um, to a higher level, and I'm going to show another attack called a key exfiltration attack. And this is going to break all the simple schemes, and we're going to have to bring up some really new ideas. I'm going to show you a new encryption scheme that solves that attack model, but there's going to be some pe penalty there. We're going to have to pay some performance costs. All right, but first, what is updatable encryption? And what's the setting we care about? So it works like this. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of mobile devices, and we've got these wonderful uh, cloud storage systems, systems like S3 and Dropbox. And I want to use these cloud storage systems to store my data because they're highly available, they're highly durable, um, I can do backups, it's easy to do synchronization. But maybe you don't want to put all your plain text on S3. Right? There's some risk that it might become public, or maybe somebody's going to break into S3 and you're worried about that. Fortunately, we can solve this really simple problem, right? We know how to do symmetric encryption. So on my device, I generate a secret key, and instead of uploading the plain text to the cloud, I encrypt that plain text with a key, and I upload the ciphertext to the cloud, right? We know how to do this. Um, in this talk, this is the notation I'm going to use. So those, those curly brackets with the key indicate symmetric encryption under this key K1. All right, so this is pretty good um, because if you break into the, if you break into the cloud uh, or if your S3 bucket gets exposed, there's only ciphertext. And as long as I keep the key secure, I'm okay with attackers having my ciphertext. At any time, I can download that data from the cloud. As long as I have the key, I can recover the file, I can read it, I can operate on it, I can make updates. All right, but it's never really just one file, is it? It starts off with one innocent like Google Photos upload, and next thing you know, you've got 300 gigabytes sitting in Google Photos. And at some point, you might decide, hey, I want to rotate this key. What are some reasons we might want to rotate a key? Well, this is an encryption talk, so probably a lot of you guys already know, whenever there's a key, it's good security hygiene to rotate a key. And we just know empirically that this solves a lot of problems. Uh, in in um, specific cases, I might have a compromised device, right? That key might be on my laptop. It might also be on my phone. Maybe I lose the phone. I still have a copy of the key. And I don't know that somebody has that device, but that key's floating out there somewhere. And I think, hey, how can I get away from that key? So I only want to generate a new key, uh, and then, of course, not send it to my lost phone. In some cases, you're required to rotate keys. Regulations like HIPAA and PCI require regular key maintenance. Uh, and the most common thing, and this is going to be one of our attack models today, is this like deauthorized operator problem. If I have a group and we all share a key, and two of you guys leave the group, you go, you know, join the army in North Korea or something, I might think, hey, I don't want this guy to have this key anymore. Um, you know, we want to rotate to a new key. But how are we going to do this? I've got, you know, 300 gigabytes sitting in uh, Google Cloud Photos. If this is the device, I don't have enough CPU bandwidth or power to download all those, all those files, decrypt them locally, re-encrypt them, and re-upload them to the cloud. So what I want is a better technique. I want some way so I don't have to download all the data, but I can still get key rotation. And that's what we're going to approach. OK, so let's try a different technique. Um, we're going to introduce a technique we call updatable symmetric encryption. 
So the settings still looks the same. In the cloud, I've got, say, 100 files encrypted under some key. I've got the key locally. What I really want to do is download from the cloud some amount of metadata, some very small headers, locally run some computation. And the inputs of that computation are going to be my old key, my new key, and some of this metadata that we've downloaded. I'm going to call the output of that an update token or rekey token. And I'm going to send that back to the cloud. And what I want is the cloud provider to be able to apply what we call re-encryption. So the cloud provider can take the rekey token, apply it to the ciphertext, and get a new ciphertext that's now recoverable by the new key but not by the old key. All right? And there's a, there's a naive way to do this, which is just to send the keys to the cloud provider and have him do the decryption and re-encryption for you. But that defeats the point of using symmetric encryption. So we're only going to consider schemes that allow us to transform directly from ciphertext to ciphertext. Now this might seem a little magical, and, uh, and the technique I'm going to show you, Recrypt, actually does some really cool magic with key keyhole morphic encryption. Uh, but there's actually really simple engineering techniques to build this. Maybe some of you even know how they work. So let's look at the obvious way to do this. So the obvious way is something called simple envelope encryption. And it works like this. If I want to encrypt a file under a key, I first generate a new key called a data key. I encrypt that data key under the master key. I then take that data key and use it to encrypt the file. And hopefully in a slide you'll see why this is useful. So that first part I'm going to call a header. Right? And that header is an encryption of just a data key. Right? So it's very small. Right? A symmetric encryption key is usually 16 or 32 bytes. Add a couple extra bytes for an IV, a couple extra bytes for a tag. All in, you're talking about 50 bytes. So that's very small. The second part is going to be the body. It's going to be very large. So a little bit of overheads. But for the most part, it's going to be the same size as the file. So if you're encrypting a 10 megabyte file, you're going to have a 10 megabyte body. So you can see we have this really big ciphertext body and these really compact headers. And that's going to be really useful. Now both the header and the body, we're going to use authenticated encryption. And for that, a cryptographer just means an encryption algorithm that both gives us confidentiality and integrity. And we have existing schemes to do that. So we'll just pop over to the NIST webpage and I'll show you, uh, I'll show you some algorithms that do this. Um, so we, NIST is down uh, because politics. So uh, I guess you'll just have to take my word for it that there are encryption algorithms that give us confidentiality and integrity, uh, stuff like AES GCM. OK, so now we've seen how to encrypt stuff, then how do we do key rotation? All right, so here's the setting again. All our files are in the cloud. They're using this header body construction. We generate a new key locally. And then we download just the headers from the cloud. All right, so if I've got 100 files and I've got these 50 byte headers, right, that's a really small amount of data. That's like four kilobytes of data. So I download these headers. I decrypt them with my first key. I re-encrypt them from the, with my second key. And I then upload them to the cloud. And then re-encryption is really, is really simple. The cloud provider overwrites the old headers with the new headers. And hopefully you can see that when we're done, we have a file that can be recovered with the second key, K2, and can't be recovered with the first key. OK, so we have efficient encryption. We can download small amounts of data. Uh, we can upload small amounts of data. And then we can rotate ciphertext to ciphertext to a new key. So this technically is an updatable symmetric encryption algorithm. And why do we care about this algorithm? The reason we care about this one is because it appears that this is the algorithm everyone is using. So if you scrub AWS documentation or Google Cloud, what you'll see is that under the hood for things like uh, the key management service, KMS, or the encryption SDK, they're using this envelope encryption. Now, they don't disclose lots of details about it, so it's hard to tell if they're using the simple scheme or something slightly more advanced. But as far as we can tell, and to our best guess, it appears they're using sort of the, the most obvious way to do that, which is this simple scheme. OK, so what kind of security goals do we want from re-encryption? Well, obviously, when we encrypt a file with an updatable scheme, we don't want the scheme to be any less secure than a regular encryption, right? which means we're going to want confidentiality and integrity. But re-encryption is interesting. right? What do you want from re-encryption? Intuitively, you're thinking, the reason I built an updatable scheme is I might have lost some old keys. So when I do a re-encryption, I expect to get some kind of recovering security. I should get back the same confidentiality and integrity for my updated file as I would if I had if I'd done a fresh encryption. Okay, so that's what we want. Now we're using validated algorithms, right? We're using authenticated encryption, and we put them together with this simple envelope scheme. The question is, does this give us any security? 
Well, Dwight Schrute is, uh, is skeptical. I hope you are too. Um, also, I spoiled it in the first slide because I told you I was going to show attacks. So essentially, uh, I want to walk through two threat models. In the first threat model, very basic threat model, we're going to give the attacker read-write access to the cloud, but we're not even going to give the attacker any keys. And I'm going to show you an attack, attack I call a mix-and-match attack. And then we're going to update the, uh, uh, upgrade the threat model, and we're going to give the attacker some old keys, right? Because this is what we expect re-encryption to do. And then I'm going to show you another attack called a key exfiltration attack. All right, so let's start with that first threat model. Okay, so in this threat model, we're going to give the attacker access to our cloud storage, but we're not even going to give him keys. Okay, so let's start with the scenario. So um, here's our protagonist, Sarge. Uh, Sarge's job is to lead his platoon through some um, uh, hostile territory, and he wants to go whichever route has the least number of bad guys. Uh, so Sarge is in a tough position. This is the valley he needs to get through, and essentially there's two paths to this valley, a left fork and a right fork. But fortunately, Sarge has something really great. He has access to some really excellent overhead imagery, which gets uploaded to a, a cloud storage provider. Um, and he's very, he's very confident in the security because it's not only encrypted, but the keys are rotated on a regular basis. OK, so satellite flies overhead. It shoots an image of the valley. Uh, hopefully, you can see there's some bad guys on the left-hand side here. So those, those bad guys show up in the image. The satellite then uploads this to the cloud. It's encrypted under the first key. So this first image is encrypted using our simple envelope encryption, and it's uploaded to the cloud. Sarge doesn't leave that day. He's, I don't know, he's working on his Humvee, or I don't know what platoon leaders do. Um, but he doesn't leave on January 1st. And on January 2nd, the bad guys have moved, right? They've moved from the left fork to the right fork. Satellite captures this on image. It then updates the file that's stored in the cloud. So the second version of the file is then overriding the first file, and it's uploaded to the cloud, and we're using this simple envelope encryption. OK, so after this upload, there's a regularly scheduled key rotation. Let me go back one. Um, and so the latest version of the file is now updated to the latest key. Okay? And now Sarge is going to access the cloud, and he's going to try to figure out which of these two images is the truth. But we're going to give our attacker a chance to step in here, because right? our attacker has read-write access, and he's seen all these versions of the file. So the attacker is going to do is try to construct a forgery. And what he's going to do is he's going to take the header from the most recent version of the file, and he's going to take the body from the oldest version of the file, and he's going to piece them together. And if you look closely, right, this is actually a valid encryption of an old version of the file under a new key. And this is a big deal, right? Um, Sarge is going to download this file. It's the wrong image, uh, but it's going to decrypt fine, right? He's got the second key. He's going to decrypt the header. It's a valid header because it was encrypted properly. He's going to recover the data key. It's the right data key. He's going to use that to decrypt the, the second body. It's going to be valid. And so he's going to think that this is the latest version. And this is a big failure for a symmetric encryption algorithm. Right? This allows the attacker to generate a forgery. Essentially, I'm rolling back the state of the file under a state that was never encrypted under this key. Right? And authenticated encryption is not supposed to do this. Right? It's supposed to guarantee integrity. OK, so this is bad. The good news is it's, it's fairly simple to fix. All right, so we fix it with, a, uh, with an algorithm we called KISS. And, uh, and this is how it works. So in simple envelope encryption, I have this header, this header body structure. In KSS, I have this structure. It's fairly similar, except I'm going to take the authentication tag that's naturally generated from the body, and I'm going to move it into the header. I'm also going to play some, uh, some games with the data key. I'm going to split it into two parts. Um, that's to give us some, some security properties for some threat models that I'm not going to talk about today. And then when I want to do re-encryption, in simple envelope encryption, all we do is update a header. In KSS, we're going to re-randomize the, the data key with a little bit of uh, a random data. But the important part here is that the authentication tag is still going to be in the header. Putting this authentication tag in the header means that the header is bound to that version of the body. So, right? so it's no longer trivial to just mix and match files from different versions and different keys and create a valid encryption. OK, so this is good. We've stopped the, miss and the mix and match attack. And if you look at what we've done, we've not added any performance overhead. Right? We're moving some bytes around. We're adding some XORs. But fundamentally, we're not changing a lot of the underlying encryption. And so there's no change in the performance profile. OK, so this is good. But we're about to uh, ratchet up the threat model to a stronger threat model, and we're going to see we're going to see these schemes fail. OK, so second scenario. 
Alice, Bob, and Charlie, they work for a uh, global, uh, globally present um, international hotel chain. This hotel chain handles a lot of passport data. And as we all know, passport data should always be encrypted, right? I think everyone in this room can agree that passport data should always be encrypted. OK, so it's great. Warriot totally knows what they're doing. Uh, not only are they updating or encrypting passport data, uh, but they're actually using updatable encryption because they're, they're thinking ahead on these things. So they got all these data in the cloud, all these files in the cloud. Um, and at some point, one of these sysadmins gets fired. So Charlie doesn't really know why he got fired. Alice and Bob mumbled something about like lurking around in trench coats and stealing data. Um, he thinks it's unfair, but he actually is stealing data. Um, so what Charlie decides to do is download a bunch of data uh, and burn it to a Lady Gaga CDR. Right? I don't really know why he doesn't have USB, USB drives, but in this scenario, he has a Lady Gaga CDR. And so he can't actually fit all the passport data on the CDR. So what he, instead what he decides to steal is just the underlying data keys, right? So I have my master key, K1, and I have all these data keys. I have them on this, I have them on this CDR. Uh, Charlie puts them on his trench code, and he scoots off. So Alice and Barb uh, know that Charlie is shady and that he's got this, uh, this key, so they decide to run a key rotation. They generate a new key, they update all their files, they delete all the old files. And now let's see what happens under both simple envelope encryption and KSS. Okay, so in simple envelope encryption, if Charlie then gets access to the cloud data, he still has the underlying data key, which means he can still read all those files. In fact, he can make arbitrary modifications to those files, right? Because he has the underlying data key, he can go in and change passport images or change what these files look like or even generate new files, paste headers on them, and they're going to decrypt like valid files. So in this threat model, the simple envelope encryption completely falls apart. We don't get confidentiality and we don't get integrity. KSS does a little bit better, but it's still not perfect. So we lose on confidentiality with KSS, right? The attacker has the underlying data key, so for all the files that were encrypted, at least when he stole data keys, he can still read those files. So this isn't great. He can't make change to those files though, right? Because we changed the way we did authentication, right? You put authentication tags in the header. He doesn't have access to the new key K2, so he can't change the files. But Going to somebody and telling them like, hey, use this encryption scheme, it gives you half security, that's really not the right message, right? Like nobody wants to know which, which half is secure and which half is not. What we really want um, is, is to be able to make strong claims, all right? And what's really happening here? So what's going on is that in both of these schemes, we're really not refreshing the data key and we're not changing the most of the ciphertext, right? We're fiddling around with header bits and in some threat models that gives us security, but in a threat model like this, it really doesn't give us anything. Right, so you could say that we're not really rotating keys. Right? We're changing master keys, but we're not changing underlying keys. Okay, so if we want security in this threat model, and this is actually a very reasonable threat model, right? People leave all the time, have access to data. Um, what we're gonna need is some really new approach. So we worked on a scheme, it's called Recrypt, um, and it's gonna give us updatable encryption. <clears throat> and to build it, we use something called key home morphing encryption. And a simple explanation of key homomorphic encryption, it's a scheme that allows us to change the key without accessing the underlying plain text and without changing that plain text. Okay, so for a simple definition, let's say I take a message M, a file M, and I encrypt it under a key A. If I encrypt that ciphertext again under another key B, it's the same as if I had done an encryption under a combination of those keys in a single pass. And then of course for encryption to be useful, we need a corresponding decryption algorithm. So if I take that combined ciphertext, I decrypt it under the combined key, in a single pass, I should be able to recover the original message. Okay, so that's a high level introduction to key homomorphic encryption. Um, it's actually fairly straightforward to build key homomorphic encryption. You can build them out of pretty much any public key primitive. Uh, we built ours out of elliptic curves. You can also build them out of RSA. So given key homomorphic encryption, we can now build a very good updatable encryption scheme. So we're gonna use the same um, techniques we use from KSS. We're gonna have this header in this body. When we do an encryption, it's going to be a single pass um, over the file, uh, and here's the header, here's the body, and in the first time, the data key is just this value x. But when we do re-encryption, what we do is we send a new value x prime to the cloud provider, and the cloud provider not only updates a header file, but it also applies a fresh encryption of x prime to the ciphertext, right? So now the data key has changed. It's now not just x, it's a combination of x prime and x. 
The cloud provider has been able to apply an operation of the ciphertext bits, and yet we never had to give the cloud provider access to the full data key, and we never gave the cloud provider access to the plain text. Right, and this is where we get all the security and recrypt. Right? The data key is going to be changing to a fresh data key with every pass, and all of the ciphertext bits are going to be updated. Okay, so this is going to give us the strongest security, even in the model where attackers have old keys and they have access to these underlying data keys. So it's going to give us confidentiality, it's going to give us integrity, and even in these really strong security models. So there's a couple of problems, or a couple of gotchas here. Um, one trick is that we're using uh, public key encryption schemes. Public key encryption schemes are naturally slower, and we're applying them to the entire ciphertext body. We're also updating all the ciphertext bits. So instead of just flipping header bits, we're, of course, we're operating over a much larger data set. Um, and so it's going to cost us something in performance. OK. Upside, we just fixed cloud encryption. The downside is we're going to need a lot of CPUs to do this. All right, so let's look at some numbers. This is how we get performance and security trade-offs in the three encryption schemes I showed you today. All right, so uh, for example, we'll, we'll look at encryption times for a 10 megabyte file. Using the simple envelope encryption technique, right, the technique we think everyone's using, encryption is very fast, right? It takes like 90 milliseconds to do 10 megabytes, right? It's essentially, uh, it's, it's not complete, uh, it's not zero, but it's not really a noticeable amount of time. The downside is the simple encryption technique doesn't give you security in most settings, right? You're not getting protection uh, in this mix and match environment, and you're not getting uh, any protection if attackers have access to the underlying key. So KSS is better, right? There's no impact on performance because we're still doing the same symmetric encryption operations. And we get protection in the weakest security models, but we don't get protection in the strongest. To get that, we have to use something like Recrypt. But Recrypt is really expensive. Public key operations are about 1,000 times slower. So a 10 megabyte file is going to take about 85 seconds to, uh, to encrypt. Right, so eight, I, see, I see people shrugging in the audience. Yeah, eight and a half seconds per megabyte, that is, like, uh, that is not, uh, that's not inconsequential, right? Um, the upside is, if you have data that's really valuable, Recrypt actually gives you the, uh, the security that you expect, which is after a key rotation, you recover security as if it was a fresh encryption. OK, so what are the takeaways from this, right? If you're a builder, you should be using either KSS or Recrypt, not the simple scheme, depending on where you fall on this performance security trade-off. And if you're a buyer, you should know which scheme uh, AWS or Google Cloud is. Ideally, if you're a buyer with a lot of money, hopefully you can lean on AWS and get them to expose exactly how they're doing this um, and prove to you that what they're doing is sufficient. Uh, and with that, guys, thank you for your time. And we have tons of time. I hope you have lots of questions. Did you look at any client side mechanisms like AirCrypt or NKFS, things like that, that you were using encryption before you upload to the cloud? Or the provider didn't you know, have anything lower than that? So the, so the question was did we look at any client side uh, tools that do the encryption before things are uploaded? Yeah, so in all these schemes, we're assuming the client is doing the initial encryption and then uploading to the cloud, and then we want the cloud provider to do the, the, the re-encryption update. It, does that answer the question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Other questions? We've got tons of time. OK, so the question is, um, let's say you want to use the, I, I'm repeating it for the stream. Uh, um, uh, the question is, uh, let's say you want to use the strongest form, uh, and you don't really think ahead to how many CPUs you have. Uh, you know, wh what are the problems you're going to run into there, and especially like data corruption? Um, so on the cloud side, you, you're probably going to be OK, because on the cloud side, you tend to be on server farms, and you have lots of stuff. Uh, data, uh, data corruption could be an issue. Um, it's an issue any time you do this stuff. But usually these, uh, usually these schemes have some built-in like uh, integrity checks. So you check when you're done. Um, what's really going to hurt you, actually, is the client side stuff. So in the cloud, the, the updates are still expensive. But in the clients, you're usually on underpowered devices. You're on things like a laptop or a phone. Uh, and, uh, you know, taking 85 seconds to, uh, to upload a handful of, um, you know, Word docs to the cloud, you know, from someone's laptop is often not, uh, it's not going to be acceptable. So it depends on the setting. Yeah, another question. So 
Ah, so. No, no, so yeah, so there are schemes, you can imagine schemes where like you're just applying uh, uh, layered encryption. In the case of Recrypt, the key's actually changing. Um, oh yeah, I have to repeat the question. So the question was, um, every time you do a, a re-encryption, uh, are you just lengthening the key? So is it 85 seconds and then 90 seconds and 95 seconds? So in the case of Recrypt, uh, that operation is actually like, it's an addition and then modulo the order of the group. So the key size stays the same, even though it's a new key. But uh, you can actually build up datable encryption where you're just wrapping, right? And then your key is now a sequence of keys, and then decryption is like six times slower if you have six re-encryptions. Uh, we, we, we played around with these schemes, but we threw them out because they were just so, uh, nobody wants performance like that. That was the first time I invented my head. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, so this is how cryptographers do it, right? You invent a version of your head and you play with it on the whiteboard, and some things you just say are too stupid to, uh, to, keep, to live, so you keep moving, yeah. to understand this. Yeah, okay, so let me repeat the question. So the first question is, um, uh, is the performance the same for decrypt? Yeah, so the slide only says encrypt, um, but actually in all cases, in encryption, uh, re-encryption, and decryption, the times are almost exactly the same, right? So that 85 seconds is encrypt, that's a problem because that's my laptop. Re-encryption is also 85 seconds. That's usually not an issue because it's a cloud. I usually have lots of CPUs, or at least I have plenty of time. Um, but then decryption is also 85 seconds. So I download and then sync to access a file. That's, that's really painful. Um, the second question was more resources. Um, I'll write a blog post for, um, uh, for ShmooCon. So that'll have you know, some of this detail in textual form. Um, and then also, if you want to try your hand at security proofs, um, uh, you're welcome to look up this crypto paper. It's called Key Rotation for Authenticated Encryption. Uh, unfortunately, it's fairly dense. This is my attempt to, to make it a little more accessible. Um, or you can also send me an email or send any of our uh, co-authors an email. We love talking about this stuff. Yeah. All right, tons of time. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, so, oh, so the question was, if I combined a scheme like KSS uh, with an HSM, does that mitigate the question, or does that mitigate the need to use Recrypt? Um, if you still have access to the underlying data key, I, I haven't thought it through, but I'm gonna guess, if you still have access to the underlying data key, uh, my guess is it's unlikely, because most HSM operations don't actually decrypt the whole value, right? If you look into how, um, like, uh, AWS uses KMS, they actually use, they, they use these HSMs, but they use them to encrypt the data key, and then they give you back the data key, and they ask you to decrypt in CPU, because they usually don't have, like, they can't ship that much data over the wire, and they can't do that much decryption operations. So, in theory, yes, but I think in practice, you usually have like a four kilobyte limit on these, uh, on these files. Other questions, we got tons of time. Adam, we have a question on the internet. Awesome, hi internet. So, restoring an old version of a file. What is the what is the process for? Um, can you run that back? Can you run that by me one more time? Yep. What is the approach on version control backups in the cloud after re-encryption caps is sent, i.e., restoring an old version of a file? Yeah. So this is a great question. So what's the um, you know what's the process for? Um, uh, you know, doing backups for old versions. Uh, we didn't look at anybody's specific implementations, uh, so we essentially assume the worst. We assume that most people keep around old copies, uh, especially if people have, like, uh, if attackers have access, savvy attackers may be saving old versions. Um, I, actually, I do happen to know, I, I've read in, in AWS's documentation that they actually do usually keep old versions of keys laying around because sometimes when clients do key rotation, they still have old keys, so they still need to rotate back. So in some cases, even after you do key rotation, the, all these old headers are sitting around somewhere just to make sure in case you need them. Other questions? All right, well, thank you guys.